Our next speaker is TRU Faculty of Law Professor Nicole Chavez. She has studied at universities of Sydney and Ottawa and has a law degree and MBA from the University of Vienna, where she is currently in her PhD. She completed her Canadian professional accreditation as a lawyer at the University of British Columbia and has been practicing law in BC for 10 years. Professor Chavez is fluent and has worked in four languages. Nicole is part of the legal team for the Sequatin, Okanagan, and Union of BC Indian Chiefs before the Supreme Court of Canada in the Sokotin versus British Columbia BC title case. She has worked with and for Indigenous peoples in the interior for over a decade, and also for people on the Lower Fraser. Nicole was co counsel for Stolo Tribal Council in Chiam at the Cohen Committee into the decline of the Fraser River sockeye salmon, and continues to work with them, including on the National Energy Board Trans Mountain Pipeline hearings. Nicole Chavez is a full-time faculty member of the TRU Faculty of Law and teaches constitutional, Indigenous, and environmental law. She is in also involved in environmental negotiations specifically the Convention on Biological Diversity, where some of the Indigenous prior and informed consent requirements have been negotiated. Please help me in welcome Nicole to the stage. Kus Cham, thank you. And I also want to acknowledge the Sukwapmuk people and recognize that we are on Sukwapmuk territory and also recognize the Tsilkotin chiefs uh, for the struggle they have taken on to seek and gain recognition of indigenous land rights on the ground and in the courts in, in Canada. It indeed has been a long struggle and we are coming up on the 150 year anniversary of the hanging of the Tsilkotin uh, chiefs and war chiefs and, um, on October 26, 1864. And hopefully many of us can come and support you in that uh, moment of commemoration, which really is an important moment in that struggle of protecting your territory and getting your land rights recognized on the ground. I'm gonna be speaking about um, the Tilcoteen decision before uh, that was rendered by the Supreme Court of Canada just this summer. And i um, just gonna give you and, and the audience a few keys um, to take away from the decision. It is a landmark decision that came out of the Supreme Court of Canada. I was part of the legal team for the Sokopmago Kanagan and Union of BC Indian Chiefs Intervenors, along with a lot of other Indigenous intervenors who supported the Tsilkotin in seeking recognition of a broad concept of Aboriginal title. And we were all sitting there in the early morning of um, June 26th, awaiting the decision and within really one of seeing the decision and seeing that there had been a declaration of Aboriginal title, the first ever in Canadian history. Um, we, we knew the legal ground had shifted or Aboriginal title had finally hit the ground in Canada. And it was a very important historic moment, but it is a really the moment on which we have to build now and f really the, the, the change um, that we have to implement now and seek recognition of Aboriginal title on the ground on a broader territorial basis through British Columbia. I very much agree with what um, Chief Joe has said that Indigenous peoples have to be decision makers when it comes to access to their lands and resources. Their role as decision makers has to be recognized on the ground. The government cannot be the sole decision maker regarding access to lands and resources. And I would suggest to everybody that it's in the interest of all of us to actually have indigenous peoples be decision makers because they will take into account uh, their, their values, their knowledge, the land uses to ensure that there's sustainable development. Now, one of the key, decision, uh, the key points and legal points we got out of the Supreme Court of Canada is that it recognized Aboriginal title on a broader territorial basis and I'll take you I'll take you to some, um, some of those points more specifically, but also it set really in regard to that an important precedent for indigenous peoples across British Columbia and for indigenous peoples internationally. Chief Joe was telling you about the people in Belize, people in Belize who have also been fighting uh, land rights cases. Um, indigenous peoples across the world who have been seeking recognition of their rights. But I would also suggest, especially here in British Columbia, where no treaties have been signed historically, 
in most of the parts of British Columbia, especially here in the interior of British Columbia. And the Supreme Court of Canada recognized that. It says it in paragraph four of the decision, that there are hundreds of indigenous groups in British Columbia and dozens of larger nations effectively that have the same issue regarding recognition of their land rights. The Supreme Court of Canada was fully conscious that it was setting an important precedent for recognition of Aboriginal title on a territorial basis. It will have, and, and it should have, a, a direct implications for land management and decisions regarding access uh, to lands and resources across British Columbia and also help ensure more sustainable development and environmental governance that fully involves indigenous peoples as decision makers. And um, Chief Joe already spoke to that. Um, I, I will go with, with the Tsilkotin number of 1,900 um, square kilometers um, over which Aboriginal title has been declared. So that's the darker uh, green area. In, and again, this is an area over which Aboriginal title has been uh, declared in the core of Tsilkotin territory. And when Chief Joe was telling us about some of the work um, that DFO is doing right now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it was probably around the Chilco um, River and, and the salmon there. And the salmon have just returned spawn um, this summer in, in, in the tidal area, for the <laughs> now in the recognized tidal area. And, and that is a, an amazing intersection uh, with, the, with the work of, of, of DFO. I've, I've just co-taught co environmental law with Professor Lucas, who is also here with us, and we talked about that, and we talked about the implications of the Tsilkotin decision when it comes to environmental management. And yes, DFO is gonna have to deal directly with um, the Tsilkotin people when it comes to access um, and to protecting these, these important spawning grounds. Our elder talked about the concerns that the Sukhwapmuk people um, and also the Tsilkotin people and indigenous peoples across British Columbia have in regard to the Mount Pauli tailing spawn breach that just happened um, after, after the title decision um, and, and happened just upstream uh, from, from the Chilco River from the Canal River, the, the, the pollution flows down into the Fraser River system. And indigenous peoples are very concerned, and I suggest a lot of uh, people across British Columbia are very concerned, and look to indigenous peoples to take a more active role when it comes to ensuring protection of the environment and that those values are properly taken into account. And so this tidal area is, and is, is really an amazing starting point for a lot of this work because for the first time in Canadian history, um, we have a declaration of Aboriginal title on the ground. That is a very powerful legal remedy, one we have never seen granted by a Canadian court before. And why was the court hesitant? Because it, on a number of occasions, sent it um, to the government and to the legislature, both federally and provincially, to recognize Aboriginal title. That's what they should have after Delgamook. Um, and they basically kicked it back into that forum. But when 15 years and plus later, we still haven't seen a dec uh, any implementation and recognition of Aboriginal title on the ground, the court said, that's it. We are granting this declaration of Aboriginal title on the ground. And they wanted to send clearly a very strong, a very strong um, signal with, with, with that. Um, it, it is basically what the court tells us and, and what the court did when they declared Aboriginals that the Crown has no benef beneficial interest in this land. The Tsilkotin collectively have exclusive ownership and management rights and control over these territories. They have the right to benefit from these lands and to be decision makers regarding these lands, to be the managers of these lands. Um, and Basically, that's, that's the, the, um, the, starting, the starting point here. But again, the message has to go out to governments and, 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 and really proponents and everybody that have to engage with indigenous peoples as decision makers, as landlords, when you are seeking access um, to, to their territories. It goes hand in hand uh, with 
I would suggest with indigenous jurisdiction over those lands or the, the right to manage those lands. Um, and I'll take you to some of the provisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, some of the, um, the paragraphs from the Supreme Court of Canada that in Silco Teen, where as Chief Joe pointed out to you, the unanimous court in a decision by the Chief Justice not only declares Aboriginal title, but it declares it on a broad territorial basis. And it talks about what um, the broader concept of Aboriginal title. It recognizes that Aboriginal title is an exclusive ownership right. It also enta entails the right to decide how the land will be used, um, the right to enjoy the benefits of the land and to manage those lands and to proactively make decisions regarding this land. So it, and, and given that the Supreme Court of Canada recognized title territorial basis, what has to go hand in hand with that is territorial governance. Indigenous peoples governing their territory and being those decision makers. Um, and like Chief Cho was saying, we are gonna see the Tzilko team implementing this on the ground. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada has, has been very clear. This is, these are Aboriginal title lands. They're not crown lands. It's, from the provincial perspective, a totally new category of lands. Of course, from an indigenous perspective, that was always the category that they were dealing with. But the thing was, it's not contemplated in any of the provincial legislation when it comes to forestry, when it comes to mining. So in order to actually deal with the Tzilkotin Aboriginal title lands, they would have to amend their respective legislation to actually um, to, to, to have to be able to at all regulate uh, with it, within that, that territory. But really they have to engage and start thinking about this category of land. So that's why this declaration of Aboriginal title on the ground is so, because it can no longer be ignored. It's the first time that we're actually seeing Aboriginal title on a map and not just a map, the map that I was showing you is the map. It's the map that was drawn by Justice Vickers, um, the lower court judge who heard all the evidence from the Tilcotin chiefs over more than five years, who then, uh, then, who then basically drew this map and, and, and connected it to indigenous land uses. Chief Joe has already talked to you extensively about indigenous land uses and how, used and how that uh, testimony was put forward in, before before Justice Vickers, um, and okay, <laughs> uh, before Justice Vickers, and 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 he really um, engaged with that evidence and really listened to the Tilcotin leaders, to your elders who spoke in the language, who presented extensive evidence about those land uses, and used it to establish um, a broader territorial concept of Aboriginal title, and that was also what the Supreme Court of Canada recognized. So one of the main questions that the Supreme Court of Canada had to answer was whether Aboriginal title could be established on a broad territorial basis or whether it could only be established on a small site-specific basis. The Tilco team and the trial judge called that the postage stamp approach of the province of British Columbia, where they were arguing you could only establish title to those very small spots. On the other hand, the Tilco team were putting forward all their evidence about the extensive use of their land and that would be the basis of a broader territorial declaration of Aboriginal title. Um, the province all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada stuck with their narrow concept um, of Aboriginal title. As Chief Joe pointed out in the BC Court of Appeal, um, Justice Groberman writing for the court sided with that very narrow um, concept of Aboriginal title and he was heavily criticized for that. Um, he, his approach basically was to say, it's good enough to declare title to small spots and then to have rights throughout the territory and you can still maintain your culture and the Tzilko team can still maintain their culture. The mic doesn't like Justice Groberman and what he said. Uh, but anyways, um, and, and to, to, to Justice Groberman, I want to say what I heard from a lot of the stories of, of the Sukwapmak elders and your oldest elders of running into the first fences. 
How is how would that ever? If 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 you live if you if if you exercise your your rights on the ground and if you live as indigenous peoples on the ground, you will all have heard those stories about running into the first fences, um, of not being able to access your territory. So that's why it was so important to get an underlying recognition of a broader concept of Aboriginal title, and that is what the Supreme Court of Canada agreed with, and they slammed the province in the process, and they did not agree with the BC Court of Appeal. What I have as the last point here on the slide is, and that's how they really down all of the province's arguments, and it's simply by saying, province, you were wrong with the approach that you were arguing, and really all your arguments were based on this approach that title can only be established to small specific areas. And I say to that, also, their legislation is both based on that approach, up until has been based on that approach. Their policies have been based on that approach. And that will have to change now that the Supreme Court of Canada has said this is an erroneous approach. Really, uh, we Supreme Court of Canada, it was quite interesting and, and, and the dynamic. Council for the Tilco Teen, Council for the Indigenous Peoples, put forward very strong arguments why there should be a broader territorial concept of title. And then the province got up and was really questioned by all the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada about their narrower, uh, much more site-specific concept. And that's when we were already realizing the court had really studied the evidence. It had really um, carefully listened um, to the Tzilkotin people and they were not going to side with the, this narrow site-specific approach to Aboriginal. Were we sure that they were going to go all the way to a really broad territorial concept of Aboriginal title? I was pretty sure because the province had no answers to them. They were asking them, they were grilling them, and they had no answers why title could not be established on a territorial basis. And truly, there is no answer to the contrary. And so, in the end, um, that's the broad declaration of Aboriginal title that we got out of the Supreme Court of Canada. And it di dismissed the approach of the BC Court of Appeal in a paragraph where they were very critical of the BC Court and they said, no, nothing in the jurisprudence, the case law, what the court has said, and nothing in what the academics have said, and for that matter, definitely nothing in what indigenous peoples have ever said, would support such a narrow concept of Aboriginal title. Rather, the right approach, in line with the Constitution and with international values, is to um, have a broader concept of Aboriginal title, and we are going to recognize that on the ground. And going back to, um, to the point about why um, it was such a powerful re uh, remedy to get ground declaration of Aboriginal title, and honestly, we were not sure on that point if the court was going to go all the way to declaring, uh, declaring Aboriginal title on the ground, they could have sent it back to trial. We were worried about which remedy they were going to uh, gra grant. But the thing there was, the court also was aware of exactly what Chief Cho was talking about. If you don't grant title, we are going to go to the international level, like a lot of indigenous peoples have done, and we are going to say we don't get effective remedies. We don't get declarations of Aboriginal title of the court until Tzilkotin, they never, indigenous peoples never had. The government doesn't recognize it in their legislation, and we can't get appropriation in negotiations when it comes, for example, to the BC treaty process. That's the very case the Halkomenum have been taking to the Inter-American Commission. And so there was counsel for the Halkomenum, an indigenous lawyer who stood up and basically told the court flat out, if you rule against indigenous peoples, if you don't recognize a broad concept of Aboriginal title, if you don't recognize Aboriginal title on the ground this time, we are going to take you international and the court was not going to take it and was not going to stand there and, and, and basically be, be in a situation where no effective remedies have been, because the government hasn't been doing anything to recognize and implement Aboriginal title on the ground. So the court here approaches a broad, um, a broader approach to Aboriginal title, a culturally sensitive approach. It tells us to listen to exactly what Chief Joe was talking about. Look at indigenous land uses. Look at how indigenous peoples have used their land, and if they have extensively used that land and have that ongoing connection to the land, you have to take into account the culture of the respective people, the nature of the land, the ability of the land to sustain a respective group of people, and on that basis, title can be granted on a broader territorial basis. So 
the court upheld that broader territorial approach and on this basis and on the basis of the precedent that the Tzilkutin have now established, indigenous peoples can establish title on a broader territorial level and, it's, and, the, and the government uh, and the province we are seeing is to a certain extent starting to take notice and realizing that this has a broader impact for indigenous peoples at British Columbia, especially in the interior of BC where you have larger indigenous territories and you better start engaging with indigenous peoples already now uh, on the basis of this territorial approach. They can take you to court, but, or you could start agreeing and recognizing Aboriginal title on the ground in your legislation, in your policies, but it really will take recognizing indigenous peoples as decision makers. It will no longer be the government's being the sole decision maker regarding access to lands and resources. So here, here is the, what the Supreme Court of Canada says about that, I hope. Yeah, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so especially in the situation that the Tzilkotin are in, once you have an, a declaration of Aboriginal title and you've established Aboriginal title on the ground, um, the requirement is one of consent. So indigenous peoples would have to consent um, to any uh, seeking of access to their lands and resources, or absent such consent, this is the but, um, they the Crown would have to justify infringement of Aboriginal title. To which I say, that's going to be difficult because the court has already told us that the province has no proprietary interest, no benef beneficial interest in the land. How are they going to justify, for example, allocating resources? When it comes to allocating resources, I can see no justification. When it comes to regulation, there might be a few arguments there, but really what the court is saying, recognize indigenous peoples as decision makers, recognize their jurisdiction, that's what consent is all about. We deal with um, consent requirements at, at the international level. And guess what? The government, at the, interna the, the, the government at the international level claims the same right, the right of prior informed consent to access to their lands and resources. Only if the government approves can um, foreign companies, for example, access those lands and resources. Well, the same is true with the Tzilkotin people. That is the basis for their jurisdiction. So we are really also, and, and a lot of, 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 of us and the lawyers put forward, forward strong international standards that refer to prior informed consent and sought recognition of that by the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada recognizes this consent requirement. And it also sends a warning and it extends it, its broader. It says, even if there is no declaration of Aboriginal title yet on the ground in some of the other territories, if indigenous peoples are successful getting a declaration of title, you might have to reconsider projects you have already approved. So there's clearly a warning there. And then to make it absolutely clear, here's what the Supreme Court of Canada says to all governments and all proponents. If you want legal and economic certainty now, you better get the consent from indigenous peoples when it comes to access uh, to their lands and resources, even before you have a declaration of Aboriginal title on the ground. So this is really where the Supreme Court of Canada points to um, the right approach really being to recognize Aboriginal title on the ground now and clearly seek the consent of indigenous peoples when it comes to, ac to access to their territories. Um, and this is, this is really new because um, the Supreme Court of Canada already in Delgamook recognized that Aboriginal title has a strong jurisdictional and a strong economic dimension. And of course, we all know on the ground that non-recognition of Aboriginal title effectively causes economic uncertainty. It puts a lot of these projects in limbo. Um, and failure to recognize Aboriginal title on the ground causes legal and economic uncertainty and will continue to cause legal and economic uncertainty. So what I suggest the right approach would be to do now, to recognize indigenous peoples as decision makers. I'm pretty close, Bonnie. Uh, I still got a green sign, not red yet. Um, so I'll, I'll just skip about the, um, through the point about um, th that the Supreme Court of Canada made regarding application that provincial laws 
or the Forest Act, for example, right now does not apply to these Aboriginal title lands because the province didn't even think about Aboriginal title lands. It did not properly take that into account in their legislation, in their policies when it comes to access to lands and resources. So that's where big ends and changes will have to happen. Um, it is a very important legal precedent um, that will hopefully be used and implemented um, by other indigenous peoples and other indigenous peoples will hopefully support the Sukhwapmuk, uh, the, the Tsilkotin people, as I'm looking at some Sukhwapmuk, at the Tsilkotin people in the implementation um, of their decision, but it will really benefit everybody. I was just gonna show you the picture of um, when we were all before the Supreme Court of Canada, that's Chief, uh, Roger William and some of the Sukhwapmuk chiefs who were representing the Okanagan uh, and Sukhwapmuk logging lit against Chief Judy Wilson and Chief Wayne Christian, who is hopefully going to speak to this point at the end, and some of the legal counsel. And um, so just to make the point that's relevant to this territory, uh, the Sukhwapmuk and Okanagan have the next big title case in the pipe before the courts. And it's been ongoing for 15 years. In 1999, the Sukhwapmuk and Okanagan went logging without a provincial permit to assert their jurisdiction over their Aboriginal title lands, over the forests, and to, um, to establish their ownership rights effectively over the trees. This case has been in the court for 15 years, but Chief Cho will tell you that their case was in, in the courts for over 25 years. Their, court act, their case actually benefited to a certain extent from the Sukhwapmuk and Okanagan case because they established a cost award and that the province actually had to pay for part of their legal fees. So the Sukhwapmuk and Okanagan logging case has already been to the Supreme Court of Canada just on the funding issue, but they haven't been to trial even yet. But uh, we took the issue before the World Trade Organization and NAFTA and argued before those international trade tribunals that the government's policy and especially the federal government's policy not to recognize Aboriginal title um, on the ground constitutes a subsidy. So the companies don't have to pay the indigenous owners of the resource. And those arguments were actually accepted by, by both um, W2 and NAFTA tribunals, further recognizing that economic dimension of Aboriginal title and rights. Okay. And here's kind of the point that I really want to close with. Um, I see Aboriginal title and the recognition and implementation of Aboriginal title as a great opportunity for all. Um, recognizing Indigenous peoples as decision makers when it comes to access to lands and resources will ensure more sustainable development. Indigenous knowledge carries the most long-term data about the respective territories. Indigenous peoples see a very clear and important role to be caretakers of the land and to balance some of those interests. So to have Indigenous recognized as decision makers who are close to, your, to the respective lands and territories, I think will be um, really to the benefit, benefit of all and it can fill some of that void that we are seeing on the ground when it comes to environmental governance and regulation, where the federal government is pulling more and more out of their responsibilities to look after the environment. You've just heard about Mount Polly and some of the concerns that indigenous peoples have that not sufficient action is being taken to protect the environment. Indigenous peoples have always shared these concerns. They want to play this role. Um, really, I think it's, it's really going to be in the benefit of um, to the, all the people living in the respective territories. And so I just want to leave you with, with, with that thought and really um, to re-emphasize re the important role um, that indigenous peoples can play uh, when it comes to sustainable development and land management decisions. Cooks Cham, thank you.